as you can see from the screen in just a minute, tonight the title of our Bible study is actually The Truth About Food. And to give a short disclaimer, I am not an expert. I am not here to tell anyone how to eat. I am just here to explore Bible verses that are commonly misunderstood and misinterpreted. And the best way to do that is to just read the verses before it and after it to give it a context. And sometimes I might shed a little historical commentary or context on it. But I have found that in my life, it's really easy to misinterpret things if you just take a random Bible verse. If you do that, some people do it to support polygamy. Others did it to support slavery. Um, some people even support adultery with just a verse or two from scripture. And we certainly don't want to do that when it comes to doctrine. We want to be yeah. like the Bereans who studied, who took a little here, took a little there, who studied the context and poured over the scriptures until they understood those verses. So tonight we're going to go into what does the Bible say about food and particularly clean and unclean meats, because this is a big point of controversy between denominations, and even between religions. As you can see from the screen, there's many different religious based diets in America right now. It's pretty popular to be vegan or vegetarian. It wasn't always like that, um, but in terms of religion, the major religions that actually have dietary restrictions are Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Rastafarianism, and Seventh-day Adventism. And it's interesting that we're actually the only Christian denomination that's on there that thinks that the Bible actually has something to say about what we eat. Tonight, we're going to look at the original diet, which many of us are already familiar with. We're going to look at the benefits of this original diet that God gave us. We're going to look at what types of foods are we going to eat in heaven. And then we're going to look at four key Bible verses that are oftentimes used to support the eating of alligator or of snake or of shark or of any other exotic food out there. So we're going to see like, what does God say? Is it really important or is it not important what we put into our bodies? So to jump right into it, this may be familiar to lots of people, but it's always good to go back to the beginning. Gen means beginning, so Genesis is the book of beginnings. So if someone would be willing to read Genesis 1, 19 to 30, excuse me, it should be 29 to 30, Genesis 1, 29 to 30, there's two verses on the screen, or you can read it from your Bible in any version. But if you would bless us with reading those two verses, that would be wonderful. The ones that are there now? Yes, Ashley? there's like okay. two bullet points at the top. Thank you. Okay, I'll read it. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Note that fruits, nuts, and grains were the original diet for man, while vegetables were intended for animals. So what were some of the foods that the Lord originally gave us in Genesis chapter 1? He gave us fowl. Mm -hmm. Fowl of the air. Mm -hmm. fruits yeah. and nuts yeah it looks like he gave us exactly what you said herb bearing seeds so anything that is reproduced through a seed and any tree anything that was growing on a tree like a nut or a fruit and it's very interesting that even the animals were given this so the beast of the earth the fowls of the air everything that creeps on the earth wherein there is life they were also given these foods so in the beginning, at the very beginning, even the animals were vegetarian. But that wasn't always the case. And we can see the curse started creeping upon us in Genesis chapter 3, particularly verse 17. When Adam and Eve sinned, God cursed the ground, so it was harder for them to grow these foods. And then he also gave them a second curse. And sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So before the fall, they were actually eating things that grew on trees. It wasn't until after the fall when they couldn't eat from the tree of life anymore that they were actually cursed and they had to actually start eating vegetables, things that start growing on the ground. 
And this is only my personal opinion, but out of all the foods, I personally think vegetables are actually the most important because if someone does not eat vegetables, they get a lot of problems. And many of them, unfortunately, are killing people across America today. If you want to look at this chart on the right-hand side, there's variations of this food chart, but it is very, very similar to what the Lord intended for us to eat. Lots of grains, some vegetables, some meat alternatives, and we should eat the things at the top very, very sparingly. And if we do this, um, like I said, I am not here to tell someone how to eat, but this is just looking at the original diet and some of the benefits of doing so. Um, eating plant-based is great for heart health. It aids in weight loss. Um, it's hard to be overweight if you're eating foods in their natural forms. It lowers your blood pressure. Beets in particular, beans are known for this. It lowers your cholesterol. Um, my husband and I just learned that cabbage is good for this. So that makes it a bit more palatable because he doesn't like cabbage. It's good for gut health. So instead of taking all these probiotics and all these supplements and things, just eating a well-balanced diet can actually benefit your gut. And lastly, it reduces the risk of cancer. It's still possible to get cancer, but the statistics of getting cancer on a plant-based diet are actually very, very low. A vegetarian diet can lower your risk of heart disease by 20%. On average, vegetarians live about eight years longer, and they're eight better quality years. Like, who cares about eight years if you're bedridden or if you're sick all the time? But if you're having eight quality years, that's actually a wonderful testimony to this original diet. Um, the average cholesterol level is a lot lower. And then death-related heart problems with men, it's reduced by 50% and women by 30. So even if you're not totally vegetarian, just consider incorporating more plants into your diet because that's what the Lord intended for us in Genesis chapter one. And we can actually see there's a lot of benefits of doing so. And a lot of people wonder, is there no meat in heaven? Like particularly for chicken lovers or turkey lovers, like that's sometimes a hard concept to imagine your favorite food not being in heaven. And the Bible right. doesn't have a Bible verse that says there is no meat in heaven, but we can look at some of these verses and try to piece it together to see, will there be meat in heaven? So there's Revelation 21, 4, Isaiah 65, 25, and Isaiah 11, 6 to 9. So maybe if three different people could read those verses, and then we'll talk about what those verses tell us about what we'll eat in heaven. I'll read 21.4, Revelation 21.4. The God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the formal, former things are passed away. Isaiah 65, 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Sorry, I took two. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. If you want to read the last one too, like I like it when you read. So feel free to if you'd like. I'll take it. I, Isaiah 11, 6. Chapter 6, 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leper shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den, and there, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Amen. Wow. So this is just a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. And before we talk about it, if you're a meat lover, I just want to assure you, the Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those that love him. So heaven will be even better than you ever possibly thought it could be. Also, Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So a lot of people get real nervous. They're like, oh, I don't really like this type of food. And this is what I'm going to eat in heaven. Well, God will give you a completely sanctified body and soul. You will love these things. They will be so much better than we could possibly ever imagine. So although there's not a Bible verse that says specifically there won't be meat, 
we can kind of infer from these passages that there won't be. Um, so question to you, what stands out about these passages? Like what are some things we'll be doing or what are some things we'll be eating in heaven? Well, what stood out to me is not meat related. Mm -hmm. It was this part that says, and the second child shall play on the hole of the asp and the weed child shall put his hand on the cockatrice stem. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a discussion with somebody about will there be birth in heaven? Mm -hmm. Why would you have a weaning child if it hadn't been born? But so that's a different subject. You asked us what stood out. Mm -hmm. I told you. <laughs> that's a good point. And now this is like, so for this, I didn't put any of Ellen White's writings because, right. you know, right. but I know that she does say that angels will bring the babies to the parents as they're ascending to Jesus. So I don't, I don't know if that baby is then going to grow into manhood or if it's forever going to stay a baby. I, I don't know. I also read somewhere that this was just like a poetic way of speaking. Like probably the lion is not actually going to eat straw and probably the snake is not actually going to eat dust, but it's basically just saying they're going to eat plants. They're going to be peaceful. They're not going to kill people. And maybe on the bottom here, it's just saying that they're going to be so peaceful. Even children can play with them. I don't, I don't know. That's only what I've read is that this is just yeah. like a poetic way of painting the scene. What, what are your guys' thoughts on this? I would want to check it out with a commentary, mm. like on the Bible HUD, and I'll I'll check it after the study's over with. That that's a good point because a lot of those online Bible commentaries you can see multiple commentaries at one time. I didn't know there would be snakes in heaven. I know, me either. <laughs> now, Ellen White does say, I think of Patriarchs of Prophets, that they used to be able to fly, and they had the appearance of a rainbow. They'd kind of be shimmery as they flew, and that's why the devil specifically chose the snake to mislead Eve. Um, so when they were cursed, that's why God said, you're going to crawl on the ground. Um, so I didn't know they would be in heaven. According to Isaiah, they will be. Um, but maybe they'll be in a glorified state and back to what God originally had for them. Now, this goes into a little bit more detail on what food will be eaten in heaven. Um, Jesus, actually, when he had the Last Supper, he said, I'm not going to drink this grape juice again until I drink it new with you in the kingdom of God. And new grape juice is not fermented. It's not wine. It's literally fresh grape juice. So Jesus said, I'm not going to drink it again until I drank it new with you in the kingdom of God. So I think that's very beautiful. For 2,000 years, Jesus has not touched grape juice. He's waiting to drink it with us in heaven. And then in Revelation, it actually says that if you're faithful, God will give you some of the hidden manna. So that will be exciting that finally we can taste some of this manna. And then lastly, Revelation 22 is beautiful. It talks about the throne of God and out, out of it gushes the pure river of water of life. There's a tree with a trunk on both sides and it unites in the middle and it has 12 different types of fruit. And a lot of people have wondered, is it 12 at one time or is it one fruit per month? We're actually not sure, but the Bible does say it will bear 12 fruits. And this will be absolutely amazing when you eat this. It's actually going to heal the nations. So all the pain people have gone through, all the anguish, all the racial strife, emotional strife, um, you'll actually be reviving yourself every time you eat from this tree of life. Mm -hmm. So the Bible actually only talks about basically manna, grape juice, and fruit as being in heaven, but that's very consistent with the original diet. And like I said, I didn't put up any Ellen White quotes, but whenever she has visions about heaven, the only foods she has ever mentioned is fruit and manna. So most likely we won't be eating vegetables. So for some of us, that might be good news. We'll be able to eat from the tree of life. Um, we'll definitely be eating a lot of fruit, some manna, and no meat. But that will be a good thing because we're going to revert back to that original diet. But it's not, the Bible did give permission to eat meat. 
So I'm not here to hit people over the head and say like, oh, you need to be vegetarian. You need to be vegan. The Bible actually doesn't say to be vegetarian or vegan. Now, later on in the writings of Ellen White, which I believe to be true, she does shed a lot of light on that. But script, strictly biblically speaking, there was permission to eat meat. And that's what we're going to go over tonight, because that's where the point of controversy is. A lot of people think we can eat whatever meats we want. And other people think we should only be eating certain meats. So we're going to see what the Bible has to say. So question number one, if you want to grab your Bibles, when was permission to eat meat granted? And why was this the case? So if someone wants to read Genesis 9, 3 to 5, this will tell us when God officially gave us permission to eat meat. So in general, oh answer. yes, if you could read it, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Every morning thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood, therefore shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of meat. A Thank man, you. sorry. So when was permission to eat meat granted? And why was this the case? Like, why did God tell people to start eating meat? My understanding is after the flood. Yeah. Yeah, and since the veg vegetation had been um so diminished or I guess eliminated because of the flood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never thought about that. Like Shakira brings up a good point. Like after the flood, everything was totally devastated. I mean, there there was nothing to eat. So if they weren't going to be eating meat, basically human species and animal species would have died fairly quickly. So Shakira brings up a good point. Right after the flood, people needed something to eat. Animals needed something to eat. And this is oftentimes misinterpreted because it says every living thing that lives, you can eat it. So we're going to talk about that verse in just a few slides. But throughout scripture, God has given permission to eat meat. But later on in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, it's literally a checklist. So if you're an organized person and you want to know what you can eat and what you can't eat according to scripture, just go to Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. And there's a clear distinction between clean meats and unclean meats. This is something that the Jews honor this to a T. Muslims are very strict about this and Seventh-day Adventists are very strict about this. Out of all restaurants, I love Jewish restaurants and Muslim restaurants. I don't have to worry about anything unclean or being contaminated and that's because they also have a biblical understanding of what's clean and what's unclean so you can see from this slide here god was really specific and he made it so easy to understand that even a child could understand it so there was only certain birds of the air that you could eat there was only certain insects that you could eat and the qualifiers were do they have four walking legs and do they have jointed jumping legs and there was only certain animals you could eat. And the two qualifiers were, is the hoof split and doesn't chew the cud? And then lastly, in regards to animals that are in the water, there was only two qualifiers. Does it have fins and does it have scales? And if you like a checklist, go to Deuteronomy 14 and Leviticus 11. If you're a visual person, somebody took the time to make this. And this could easily tell you if it's clean or unclean. And my husband explained it to me. These unclean animals are unclean for a reason. God didn't just pick random animals. These unclean animals are generally scavengers. If you look at what a pig eats, a pig literally eats feces if it's fed to him. A pig will eat dead bodies. A shark will literally eat a tire or a passport or a human leg. They found all these things inside shark stomachs. So these animals are scavengers. And that's why the Lord doesn't want us to eat those. If we eat an animal that is a vegetarian that chews the cud, oftentimes they have a healthier diet because they're not eating other animals because they're not scavengers. 
So God was actually very gracious and being very specific about we, what we can eat and what we can't eat. But to go back to that verse that Dawn just read, Genesis 9, 3 says, Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. And a lot of people look at this and say, okay, I can eat whatever I want. But when we think about this, in the beginning, God gave us all plants to eat, but not every plant is good for us. We're not going to eat poison ivy. We're not going to just randomly eat grass, although an animal might. So just because God gave us plants doesn't mean we eat every single plant. And it's the same thing with animals. Even though God gave us meat to eat, we don't eat every single animal that's out there. And we have to contrast it with other scripture that tells us exactly what we can and can't eat. And when we look at the animals that got off the ark, some versions say pears, um, but on the ark, there was seven clean animals and there was two unclean animals. <laughs> and as soon as they got off, they offered one of the clean animals to God so that it brought it down to six. Obviously, God wanted us to eat clean animals because there was so much more of them. And even if one unclean animal would have been eaten at that time, they would have gone extinct because there was only two. So God actually was really specific about certain animals, what to eat. And that's why even on the ark, there was seven clean animals, but only two unclean animals. Because God knew that we would need those clean animals for sacrifice and to eat. And what I did is I took a picture of this handy little booklet that I get some of the information from. It's called Answers to Difficult Bible Text by Joe Crew. Um, in the email, if you want to order it, it's great to have. But for those of you that just want to see what it looks like, this is a picture of his comments on it. So the two questions that I have at the bottom is, what was God's original diet for us? Why was meat permitted after the flood? So that's kind of like a review of what we've already been talking about, but it's always good to review before we go on. So first question was, what was God's original diet? Every moving thing that lives. Fruit, nuts, seeds. Mm -hmm. And he even gave that to the animals, like everything that moved. He gave them the same food that he gave us. And then like what Shakira mentioned is after the flood, meat was permitted. But God was really specific about clean meats and about unclean meats. And even Jews and even Muslims are very, very mm. particular about, they would rather starve than eat something that's unclean. And I, I happen to feel the same way. I believe that it's unclean for a reason. So if it means going without food or eating something unclean, like I believe that as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, it's better to go without food. But the Lord always does provide. I've never had that situation. Um, but it's always good to be faithful in little things so that if it comes to something bigger, we can remain faithful in larger things as well. Also, they were on the on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. And um, they didn't have trees to, to get food, whether they took it all aboard and the Lord kept it from spoiling or whatever. We really don't know. But yeah, somehow you bring, you bring they were fed. Yeah, if you go to, there's a there's actually something called the Ark Museum in Kentucky, and they built it to scale of the biblical Ark with the three levels in the window. And they actually speculate that maybe people brought in um, dried food. Also, there could have been some sort of like, um, I think it's called hydroponic or something, where like you grow food without soil, just like in pots with like water and things like that. So they could have grown some food in the Ark. They could have had a lot of dry and packaged food. And possibly the Lord put the animals in a state of hibernation so that the animals wouldn't consume as much food. Because if we look at Genesis 6 to 9, we can see they were in the ark for one year and 10 days. Like yeah. it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Right. But then that whole earth needed to be cleansed. So they floated on those waters. And the Bible tells us the exact months and the exact days. So like what Brenda was saying, over a year and 10 days, but yet the Lord fed them. They were not hungry. Whatever he did to provide for them was enough. And even when they got off the ark, food was provided for them. Now, there's another Bible verse. I'm sure that you've had people bring this up to you, or maybe you've heard it before, but it's Matthew 15, 11. And this says, 
not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, thus this defiles a man. So a lot of people say, oh, Jesus himself said anything that goes in my mouth, it can't defile me. But this is so important to read the context. If you read the verses before it, it literally tells you what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about food here. Back then, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees were obsessed with washing their hands. You had to wash your hands before you ate or else the food would be unclean. But they wouldn't really wash them. They would just have like a few drops of water and they would kind of like balance it on their hands and it would be a certain motion and then they would wring it off and eat. So technically didn't even cleanse their hands. If they were out in the wilderness, they would bring a little vial of water with them so that they could make sure they were ceremonially clean before they ate their food. And then they're actually angry at Jesus and his disciples. Like, why aren't you guys washing your hands? You're eating unclean food. And Jesus is actually telling them, it doesn't really matter what goes in my mouth. What comes out of my mouth, that's what matters. Because these scribes and Pharisees, they were committing blasphemy and adultery and judgment and all types of horrible things. They were so neurotic about what went in their mouths, but they weren't so careful about what came out of their mouths. So this is really important lesson to us to actually read the verses in front of the verse and to read the verses after the verse. Because we can especially see in verses 19 and 20 what Jesus is talking about. So if you'd grab your Bibles and um, read with me Matthew 15. Verse 11 is the verse that's often quoted to eat whatever you want to eat. But if you read all 20 verses, it's going to show you the context has nothing to do with what you eat, but actually what comes out of your mouth. But if someone would be willing to read Matthew 15 and just the last two verses, 19 and 20, that will tell us what Jesus is really trying to tell, teach us. So if you could read Matthew 15, verses 19 and 20. Well, I don't think it's the right verse. Oh, it's not? Well, Matthew, what did you say, 15? Yes, Matthew 15, verses 19 and 20. Well, if you want me to read them, I will, but... Okay, yeah, that, that would be great. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Okay. Perfect. I know at first it sounds like it doesn't fit, but that was actually the purpose of Jesus teaching this. He said it doesn't really matter if you wash your hands and that doesn't make your food clean or unclean. What makes it unclean is what comes out of your mouth. These fornications, these adulteries, these thefts, these false witnesses, these blasphemies. So what I always encourage people and myself to do is whenever there's a verse that can be misinterpreted, read the verses in front of it and the verses behind it to kind of set the stage and to kind of clarify the context. So my two questions at the bottom is, number one, what was this vision really about? And number two, how can we not be like the Pharisees who focused more on food rather than on their hearts? So question number one is, what is Jesus really teaching in this parable? The Pharisees were so focused on like the ceremonial cleanliness, so to speak, but then they overlooked their heart and, you know, the fact that adultery, murder, all of those things initiate in the heart. And, you know, that's what leads us to down the pathway of sin. But the ceremonial cleanliness that they they thought that they were adhering to that, that made them clean really didn't make them clean if their hearts were, you know, filled with these types of things that, that Matthew um, 15, 19 lists out, 19 and 20. Well, that's That's a fantastic summary of it. Like it, God is more concerned with what comes out of our hearts, comes out of our mouths. But that doesn't mean food doesn't matter. Like food does matter and it does matter what we eat. But I think the Lord is even more concerned with what's in our heart. And I know I oftentimes have to ponder and be like, am I like the Pharisee? Am I like the publican? I'm like both of them. So like this was a question that was good for me. And I would definitely like to hear from you guys as well. 
how can we not be like the Pharisees? Because they focused more on food rather than on the heart. So what are some things we can do so that we're not like that? Ask the Lord to clean out our hearts and our minds and our bodies. I think the Pharisees, they were always focused on other people, but never on themselves. So they would point out other people's flaws, but they were totally content with their own flaws. So I like what Brenda said. Most importantly, ask the Lord to show it to us and to remove it from us. And then secondly, I think it's, Peter or Paul, who says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So like examine your heart, see what's in there. For some of us, it might be adultery or it might be murder or it might be blasphemy. We all struggle with different things. So I think examining ourselves so that we're looking at ourselves rather than other people, um, that will help me and maybe other people not be like a Pharisee if we rely on Jesus and examine ourselves instead of other people. There's another commonly misinterpreted Bible text coming from Acts 10, verse 13. Um, I'm sure you've heard this vision before. Yeah. Peter was tired. He took a little nap before he was about to eat. Dear, dear. And then all of a sudden, this it was like a hammock, a net of all these animals came down, and they were all unclean animals. So I imagine there was alligators or crocodiles and snakes and ostriches, pigs, all these animals he would never even touch. And God is telling him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says that multiple times. And then Peter wakes up. And it's interesting. He goes downstairs and he's troubled by his dream. But all of a sudden, there was some men from Cornelius. They were pagans. They were heathens. But they believed in God. So technically, they were converted heathens. And they wanted Peter to come and to share the gospel with them. And in the past, he would have said, absolutely not. Because Jews never mingled with a non-Jew. But then it dawned on him. That's what this vision was all about. He was not to call these people unclean. They were actually his brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you read the whole chapter, the verses in front of it and the verses behind it, it makes it really clear that this vision is not about what we eat. Like God wasn't saying like for 4,000 years, you can't eat this. But then all of a sudden, I want you to eat unclean animals. He wasn't saying that at all. He was telling Peter like, don't call these people unclean unclean. And that's why he specifically gave him that vision right before he met these people. So back then, Jews wouldn't even talk to Gentiles. They wouldn't even touch them. If they accidentally touched them, they were unclean for a week and they had to go through all these rituals. And Jesus was actually showing them, you don't have to do that anymore. Talk to them, minister with them. They're your brothers and sisters. Eat with them. He's like, do not call them unclean. So the three questions I have here is, why is context so important? Number two, how can we make sure we are not misinterpreting a verse? And number three, what was this vision really about? So question number one, why is context to a Bible verse so important? The exact meaning is most important. Mm -hmm. So that you get the right interpretation of what's being said. Mm -hmm. And the more I grow in Christ, I realize that there's been some verses I've misunderstood in the past. And I think it's important that we're willing to recognize that when new light is shed upon those verses. And to me, the easiest way to um, see if I'm misinterpreting a verse or not is to actually look at the verses before the verse and the verses after the verse. Like God is very gracious and almost all the time, the context is right there. Like it literally tells you what he's trying to say in a few verses before and a few verses afterward. Um, Elaine also brought up a good point about using a good Bible commentary. Um, what other tips do you guys have? How can we make sure we are not misinterpreting a verse? For a Bible study, um, I think it's important to use what they call exgenesis, which is the study of what the individual writer intended the verse to be by going through word by word. And uh, I've learned a lot by following uh, Dr. Pauline on Facebook. 
because he does that to Revelation. Right now he's in Revelation 12. And it is so interesting when you do it that way because uh, there's always a um, honesty in what was uh, meant by the writer. Yeah, I like what you're bringing up because we would never take a book from the library and go to the 13th chapter and then the 12th chapter and then the 7th chapter and bounce around. But sometimes Christians do that when they read the Bible. They just like randomly open it, read a verse, done for the morning. Next day, randomly open it. And I'm sure that's better than nothing, but we wouldn't do that with a textbook or with another book. We wouldn't even do that with a magazine. So I feel like with scripture, context is key. And I like what Elaine said, um, going verse by verse. So like if you're reading the book of Matthew, instead of jumping around, maybe read the whole book of Matthew. Or instead of jumping around in Ruth, just read the whole book of Ruth. And I feel like when you read it in context, it makes a lot more sense. And then we're not as much in danger of misinterpreting a verse. So you, you brought up a really good point. Well, I think too that if um, it's going to take me a while to decipher, let's say Matthew 15, mm -hmm. you know, if it is probably going to take me some study to get through the first three or five verses to really get down what the writer of that particular verse had intended. Mm -hmm. So the study doesn't go that quickly. It just takes time to decipher what the writer had intended through exogenesis. Mm -hmm. yep. I think another thing we can do is read um, all other verses on the same um um, what's the word like the same theme I guess so a lot of people will use certain verses to say that you know the seventh day sabbath is no longer um, important and God did away with that at the death of Christ um, they'll use like Colossians 2 and and use certain scriptures that they believe justifies that but then when you read other scriptures about the sabbath um, especially even just in the new new testament you recognize that it was never um abolished you know christ making the statement and i think it's in luke 20 matthew 24 i believe where he says you know pray that your flight is not on the sabbath if the sabbath was done away with and why would he say that in relation to something that is future so when you read other scriptures in relation to what you're studying that you know you might have a question about or you might think is conflicting then you you can put it all together and you can recognize that, you know, you can draw a, a more solid conclusion based on a study rather than just one scripture. Yeah, that reminds me of somewhere in Isaiah it says line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Like it's important we go to other portions in scripture instead of just building a doctrine on one verse. In fact, I heard you should never build a doctrine or a belief on one verse. God is so merciful and he gives us dozens of verses for each doctrine. So like what Shakira said, just going back to other verses that have a similar theme and using them to kind of shed light on each other. There's another verse that I'm sure that maybe you've heard before, or maybe you've had a friend um, use this to say that they can eat whatever they want to eat, that it's not a spiritual issue. Romans 14, 14 says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And a lot of people will say, all right, if it's unclean to you, that's you, it's unclean to you. But if it's clean to me, it's fine because the Lord Jesus said nothing is unclean. And if you just look at that verse, it might sound like that's what it's actually saying. But once again, context is key. Reading the verses before and the verses afterward actually tell us this has nothing to do with diet. It actually talks all about how we judge other people. Because back then, a lot of the Jews who became Christians were actually judging other people for not observing ceremonial days. They had a lot of feast days. So the Jews, the Jewish Christians would actually judge the Gentile Christians for not observing those feast days. But then the Gentile Christians who had just come out of idolatry, they would judge the Jews for eating food that was sacrificed to idols. Because if you bought food in the marketplace, almost all of it was sacrificed to idols at some point. So technically, if you didn't grow your own food and you bought it somewhere, you were probably eating food sacrificed to idols. 
And some Gentiles were so distraught by this, they couldn't believe that other Christians were doing this. In fact, some of them were becoming vegetarians because almost all the meat had actually been sacrificed to idols. So there was a lot of conflict, a lot of judgment, a lot of, you know, snarkiness between the Jewish converts and the Gentile converts. So that's why within this passage, the verses before and afterwards, um, Paul says we are not to judge other people. And I like what Shakira said. She said, compare it to other Bible verses. And if you go to 1 Corinthians 8, 8 to 13, it actually sheds more light on this passage. So if you would grab your Bibles and let's head over to 1 Corinthians, which was also written by Paul, 1 Corinthians 8, verses 8 to 13. And that will talk a little bit more about what the intended meaning was. So whoever gets there, if you could read that, it's 1 Corinthians 8, 8 to 13. 1 Corinthians 8, chapter yes. 8. What verse did you say? Oh, verses 8 to 13. But me commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offended to which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when we sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Thank you, Brenda. So in the verses prior to this, verse 7, and then also in verse 10, it's talking about meat that was sacrificed to idols. So some people are so distraught that these Jewish Christians were eating food that had been sacrificed to idols. And you couldn't help it. Anywhere you bought food, it was probably sacrificed to idols. So Paul is actually saying that is not wrong. Like that doesn't make the meat unclean. These idols, they don't even exist. So as far as you know, do your best. But if you accidentally eat it, or you can't help it, it's okay, it's only food. But then he said, if it's going to cause someone else to sin, go without it. And not because he's saying you have to be a vegetarian or you have to only eat certain meats. He's saying your brother's spiritual walk is so much more important. So if it means going without something while you're around your brother or sister, then do it because you don't want to be a stumbling block to them. So we can actually apply this to our lives and even within our church today. And there's two questions here at the bottom. What are some areas that Christians judge each other on? And question number two, how can we apply the counsel of these verses to our lives and not be a stumbling block to our fellow believers? So question number one, what are some areas that Christians judge each other on? What? they wear to church mm -hmm. whether they have earrings on or rings on or necklaces mm -hmm. whether they go to church yeah well, that's yeah. true too yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. what type of clothes are worn to church does the mm -hmm. you know uh, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> and for some reason, within the Adventist church, it seems like a lot of people judge each other on what they eat. And the funny thing is, like, like I give a lot of Bible studies on this. I'm very passionate about this. But, like, 
I don't want you to ever worry. I, I don't even look at what's on people's plate and like, I don't judge people what they eat because there are times when I eat stuff that's not very healthy. So like, but I feel like within the church, sometimes there's this like major judgment and it doesn't mean that God doesn't give dietary laws and that Illinois doesn't give counsel. But sometimes we can be like the Pharisees and we can focus so much on clothes or on diet or on worship styles that we're actually missing what's truly matters to God. And it's not that those things don't matter, but we shouldn't be hyper fixating on them. And there's some other areas, like even within the Adventist church, this is what's crazy is I personally don't drink coffee. Um, sometimes I might have a decaf because obviously it's decaffeinated and there's like less caffeine in that than there is in a few pieces of chocolate. So on occasion, I will have a decaf coffee, but there are some people I won't have it around because they might think I'm drinking coffee and it'll be a stumbling block to them. Um, another example is chocolate. I don't eat a lot of chocolate. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with having a small amount of chocolate. Um, even Ellen White, sometimes her grandkids should give them just a little bit of hot chocolate around the holidays. I read that in an interview with her granddaughter. However, there are some Adventists that are very passionate about this, and they actually think eating chocolate is an absolute sin. Um, I read this article online, and she ended the article with saying, is it worth losing your salvation to eat a Snickers bar? To me, that's a bit extreme. I don't think there's anything wrong with eating a Snickers bar. However, if I was around people who had that mindset, I probably wouldn't eat chocolate around them because I wouldn't want to be a stumbling block to them. So it doesn't mean that you're fake. It just means that you're cognizant of like what other people are passionate about, whether or not they're a new or old believer, and you're just respectful of their choices, and you're just trying not to offend them. So these verses are great, and we can apply them in so many different ways, um, but what are some ways we can apply these verses to our own lives and not be a stumbling block to other people? Watch what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's exactly what Brenda said. Just watch what we do. Be like tenderhearted toward other people. If it's something that they really feel passionate about, like we don't have to do it in front of them. Um, if it's something that's wrong, we shouldn't be doing it at all. But there's other things that are just a matter of preference that if that is something that really bothers someone else, we can just be cognizant of that and not be a stumbling block to them. And that's really what Paul was talking about in this context here. He's saying, don't judge other people. Some people are going to eat foods at the market that's been offered to idols. Other people are going to be vegetarians. Some people are going to observe feast days. Other people aren't. Like, don't hyper fixate on these things. Don't judge other people. Just assume they love Jesus and they have a relationship with Jesus as well. This is a little fuzzy, but I'm taking pictures of the book here so that you can see what his writing style is like, just in case you want to order it. But as we wrap it up here, I know it probably seems like a lot of information, but it's only meant to scratch the surface and it's only meant to get you to study these issues out yourselves, which I know all of you guys are already doing. But a good example to keep in mind is the Bereans. Acts 17 says, the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if these teachings were true. So if there's anything I say that you're like, oh, I'm not quite sure I agree with that, go back to scripture, study it out, and then share with me. Because I'm not dogmatic. Like, if I make a mistake, I want to know and I want to study it out more. So please feel free to share with me. Um, I definitely enjoy that back and forth. Like I enjoy learning. Um, I'm not only here to teach, I'm here to learn. So let's be like the Bereans this week. Let's study it out more and let's do what Isaiah says. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So all the information is not in one chapter. We've got to go throughout scripture, like what Shakira said, find a common theme and then find other Bible verses on that theme so that you can study them together. Next. I was doing, oh, no, I was, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was doing some studying the other day, and I looked on a Wikipedia, and it had to do with something about what Adventists eat. And it, uh, when I did the search, it, it did not include anything about Adventists. But as I read through their description of what I was reading, I can't even remember what the topic was now, 
it mentioned Adventists are the only ones that do this. Mm -hmm. And I was quite surprised to see Wikipedia state that Adventists were the only ones that did this. It was quite surprising. I know. I thought there would be a few other Christians. I know Messianic Jews are pretty particular about diet as well, but it's I was also surprised to know that it was only Adventists. And next week, you guys, I think the history of alcohol is very interesting. Um, we're just going to briefly look at how it originated, um, the patterns throughout history. And then even within the Christian church, and I hate to say it, but even in the Adventist church, sometimes there's different views on alcohol. And that necessarily should not be the case because our baptismal vows actually call us to abstain from alcohol. So it shouldn't be an area where there's a lot of controversy, but we're in the last days. There's going to be controversy over everything. So we're going to look at what are the various views on alcohol, and then we're going to look back at what the Bible says on misunderstood Bible verses. So I think it's going to be interesting. I invite you to come out. Um, this first week, there was a lot of information. So if it didn't make sense, my apologies. I will send you out the PDF afterwards. Um, but next week, alcohol is something we're all very familiar with. Uh, you know, um, Maybe we've had a history of alcohol. Maybe we have family members who have. Maybe we've just observed things throughout the years. So next week, we'll probably hit home. And hopefully, it will be in a way that we can yeah. feel comfortable sharing with other people. So as we close, um, does anybody have any comments? Does anybody have anything they'd like to share or any prayer requests to close with? Can you pray for my mom? Of course. Is she sick? She's still in the hospital with a bad back. Oh, okay. Which hospital is she in? Um, she's in the rehab um, okay. center. Like a hospital. Okay. Well, Lavinia, we will definitely pray for her. I don't know when she's going to come out. When she's going to be able to go back home. Okay. Alex and I were supposed to close on our house um, tomorrow, but there may be a delay because of a form that we need to sign. So, you know, we're just praying that we can close sooner than later and that all will go well um, in relation to the closing. And if we could keep Jeff Waller in our prayers as well, um, he's doing fine, but, you know, he says he has a temperature and he's kind of fatigued today. So just to keep him in your prayers as well. Don, if you don't mind me calling on you, would you mind closing us in prayer? Who was that? Oh, That's would you mind praying for us? Would that be okay? Sure. Thank you. Heavenly Father, again, we uh, come to you in, in prayer and ask for your wisdom, and uh, we pray that you would uh, look on this uh, Bible study as, a, as a, a point of love pointing to us and you together. And we, we just pray, Father, that you be with us in all things that are, are things that uh, we get from the Bible that teach us how to follow your will, do the things that you would have us do, Father, for there's much going on in our world that's disturbing at this time, and we just uh, pray for other people. And loving kindness is the answer. Loving kindness to each other and, and just be following your will. And we ask this in the precious name of the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. And thanks for coming out, everyone. Um, no internet issues tonight, thankfully. So thank you for your prayers and thanks for coming out. Well, thanks for being there with us. We appreciate <laughs> it. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Good night. Everybody, Good night. Bless you. Mm -hmm. Bye.